Well, yes, we're back. And um, we said earlier that our guest of the week is a he. And um, he is here. He is a bishop. The, the, he. <laughs> the, he, the is he is here. here. And he is a bishop. And um, this is a bishop that comes from southern Kaduna in Kaduna State. And um, he went to primary school in... Um, I think it's primary school, St. Fidelis Primary School, Zagom, then St. Joseph's Minor Seminary in Zaria, before proceeding to Augustine, St. Augustine's Major Seminary uh, in Jos, Plateau State, where he studied philosophy and theology. Well, you've seen our guest, and here is Bishop Matthew Hassan Cooker. Good morning, Bishop. Thank you very much. My Lord Bishop, <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you here. Thank you very much. It's not like you were disappointed that day. My, I'm, I'm a he, not a she. <laughs> <laughs> which is she okay. Well, <laughs> we don't know. Well, no, which is okay. I mean, women don't get much of a fair share. So, uh, well, um, I'm not disappointed. I'm Thank absolutely, you for <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely excited because you're one of the um, clergymen in Nigeria. That over the years, a lot of people have wondered why have you not delved into politics because a lot of Nigerians both in the north in the south in the south south in the southwest would have overwhelmingly supporting your candidacy why have you not gone into politics I think I'm look I mean George Ware thought he could kick a football well and he was an excellent player really good footballer mm. and he thought that was the same as going into politics. And uh, <laughs> he found out otherwise. <laughs> he, found, he found out otherwise. Um, first of all, I mean, I'm a Catholic priest, and um, the discipline is pretty clear. Uh, we cannot participate in partisan politics. I cannot participate in partisan politics and still remain a Catholic priest. Plus, I mean, my position is quite simple. I think that there's absolutely nothing that I say or that I have said and will say that has not been better said by other people. I think what makes people perhaps curious is that I'm a priest. But they perhaps also appreciate what I'm saying because I'm a priest. And that comes with trust. And it's a trust that I take quite seriously. Um, I will not betray that trust by exchanging it for something else that I was not meant to be. And I look, I mean, I have studied politics long enough, and I've also studied human behavior long enough to know that those who are making these claims will not go out on the streets for me for free. Um, <laughs> it comes with a price. And they'll be the first to tell me, look, we want political power. We're not raising a church choir. So I'm not, I mean, I'm discerning enough to know, you know, that um, this is not where I belong. And I, at my age, I should be able to know a game in which I have competitive advantage. In the issue of electoral politics, no, I don't have competitive <laughs> advantage. <laughs> but the, the one clear thing is every single time that you have spoken on issues, you've captured the essence of the message in those on, on those issues that you have addressed and you've brought some amount of logic which some people say common sense and logic seem to escape some of our leaders a majority of our leaders actually because when they address issues the way they look at it just seems skewed and not correct when you have that ability to do it that way and capture essence of messages succinctly the way you do one would expect that you will then have a role to play in governance. No, I've got a role to play, and I think I'm trying my little best. You know, I mean, I was not called into... I mean, I'm not in public life in the, in the way and manner, you know, that uh, is the result of politics. Um, a lot of people, and I remember, I've forgotten who it was now, but I was interviewed by a journalist who seemed quite visibly shocked. Uh, and they thought that... Um, Almost every time I had been appointed, it came to me as a surprise because he thought this was the result of some politicking and maneuvering and scheming and so on and so forth. Um, 
I must say that I've had my own fair share and I remain eternally grateful to God. I'm a, I continue to say I consider myself an extraordinarily privileged Nigerian. I mean, I have served in at least three or four, uh, five uh, national initiatives. Um, I served in the Oputa panel. I served in the Electoral Reform Committee. I, I, I'm still working on, to, on the Shell and Ogoni reconciliation. I, I, I'm involved with the, with the initiative by the Northern Governors to come to terms with the problems of the aftermath or whatever of Boko Haram. So I, you know, these are, these, are, these are extraordinary opportunities. And I don't think that I've had that chance because I'm better, I'm the best. I'm definitely not. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, governance is not about logic. And when you are dealing with a dysfunctional environment such as what we have in Nigeria, a few things just need to be fixed. And they're not brain surgery. They're not rocket science. Um, and often we've made a point, and I think the case has been made eloquently by many people, that we need uh, heads of state or presidents with enough gray matter. It's important that they have. And it's important that they have university degrees. It's important that they go to university. But at the end of the day, if you're a graduate of the University of the Heart, it's perhaps far more important. Um, Julius Nyerere was, of course, evidently an educated man. But he was an extraordinarily good man. And if you go to, if you go to Zambia, you're not going to find a bunch of rich people going around in Zambia. But you will find a very contented group of people. Mm. Um, so the problem with, with, the, with, with the Nigerian situation was that we, we've ended up with a situation in which you know, those who are the governed are far better equipped than those who are doing the governing. Uh, it's almost akin to being taught by, I mean, it'd be embarrassing to be in a class in which too many of the kids are brighter than you, the teacher. Mm -hmm. You remain in a constant <laughs> state of, of, of feeling inadequate and mm -hmm. so on. You can compensate for that inadequacy by being harsh, by being brutal and stopping children from talking. You know, so, but it really, the point I'm making is that our situation has gotten to a point in which, I mean, we've gone past the point in which we are looking for leaders now. That's not what the Mandelas of this world have had their time. That's not what Africa needs now. Um, <laughs> we're not looking for the Sadonas or the Awolo Wars. Even if they came to Nigeria, nobody would recognize them. Mm -hmm. this, this, this moment calls for a clear appreciation of the severe limitations of institutional leadership. Leadership as a big man sitting somewhere. I mean, the fact that Nigerians continue to talk about Jonathan in relation to Boko Haram and to continue to talk to, it's largely a function of the over 30 years of the, of the trauma of military rule. So we continue to expect the big man, we, because we knew that if the head of state coughed in, in Abuja, somebody collapsed in, in, in Sokoto and, or lo, and lost power. Um, if the head of state uh, blinked, uh, the governor in Akwaibom moved and so on and so forth, and that the president could take whomever he wanted and make minister today and remove. Now, presidents no longer have those kind of powers. So it's important that we appreciate the fact that we're, we're in a democratic environment, definitely not perfect, but that the president has severe constraints, and it's not as if it's a military you know, president. The governors are not, somebody has called them dictators. Maybe so, but that is as a result of the inability of the constituent parts to appreciate what their roles are. So really, what I'm talking about, we need a more diverse you know, approach and appreciate and you know, appreciation of leadership okay um let while you're talking about leadership some of us have had the special privilege of listening to your speeches over the last 20 years plus and i can think back now and say you've met practically all the heads of states of nigeria over the last 20 years i, I can't think of one that you haven't met you can correct me if that is wrong now if you look at the leaders we have had in nigeria and the situation we now have, what is it that is in all of those leaders from Obasanjo to Babangida to uh, Buhari to uh, you name it, to Yaradua? I think you probably even met Yaradua before he died. Now, with all of those people, what is it that is in our leaders that has made it such that Nigeria has not been able to achieve what it should have achieved as a, t as a nation? that has the potential? Well, maybe, I don't know. <clears throat> you see, let me... First of all, I appreciate what you're saying. And it's actually because I've met a lot of these people who are extraordinarily good people. 
I mean, they have not met any single Nigerian head of state or president that plan to destroy this country. Mm. You've met Abacha, uh, and but you think you know, he's a good let man? Let me tell you, I mean, if you, if you, when you read my book, and uh, if we have an opportunity, unfortunately, Abacha is dead. And unfortunately, still, those who stood up for him are in the background now. But were we to have a much more robust national debate about the legacy of Abacha, history's verdict would be completely different. But that's a different matter altogether. And I'm talking here... You know, there are a lot of the facts that we can add. Without Abacha, there will be no good luck, Jonathan, today. Let me put it that way. If there hadn't been a Bielsa state, nobody would think about it just, you know, today. Without uh, Abacha, there wouldn't be. Uh, my friend Kyle Defiame would not be sitting as governor of, uh, of a kitty today. <laughs> Without Ab I mean, you know, we, I mean, we can go the whole hog. But what I'm saying is, and you, you know, you, you, are, you, are, you are spot on. But let me take a, sing a single journalist like Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman is the, is, the, is the foreign affairs correspondent of, the, of uh, the New York Times. When Obama became president, he had to spend about five hours with him on the golf course. Because he is perhaps one of the best intellectuals in America, public intellectuals in America. Okay, he, he, he wrote before uh, globalization came with his challenges and was formally structured. His book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, defined what globalization was going to be and the consequences for America. He went on to publish a second book called The World is Flat to alert America about what was happening with outsourcing India and the other China. economies. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying in effect is, you know, we, when we talk, at, Nigerians talk about leaders, and I'm being a little bit philosophical here. You know, I don't call many of these people leaders. I call them office holders. You know, they hold office. No, I mean, this is the truth, and I don't mean disrespect. When you think of any leader, try reading Obafemi Awolowo, or try reading Aminu Kano. You will see evidence of people who spend endless days and nights thinking about life and thinking about how do you bring about a good society. They were not in office. They were not in office, but they were they had the clarity of mind, all right, mm -hmm. to, 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 to understand the, the environment within which they hopefully were going to operate. So if I became president, this is the kind of thing I would like to do. And like I said two weeks ago, we have ended up in a situation in Nigeria, and I've done the study. The timelines are there. You start from Tafha Balewa to Good Luck Jonathan, and you will see that there isn't a single Nigerian president that has not come to occupy that seat purely and simply by good luck. And like I said, their good luck has been our bad luck because we've not <laughs> been so lucky. To, but the point I'm making is when you have this kind of people stumbling and fumbling into public office, they, are not, they may have all the good intentions in the world, but there is nobody that I know of. Plotting a coup is not the plotting to be a leader. So the point is, for, for, the, for the kind of, I mean, for Obama, for example, to have managed to put in place uh, this healthcare program that for 65 years, Americans, white America, nobody, in, no American president had been able to come through, meant that this young man had the presence of mind. He's not a medical doctor, but he had the, the capacity to rally around people who could get the job done. It's not like the situation in Nigeria where you become president and traditional rulers, retired generals, all kinds of people are pushing their sons, their nephews, their daughters, their friends, their stooges to come and be president. And we, I mean, you know, to, you know, to, to come and hold public office. office. And you go to Abuja to become a minister. It depends on what, how much you are man, you are sponsor contributed. Okay, if you read, um, if you are a professor of medicine, it doesn't mean you're going to be minister for health. Okay. You can be minister for the richest position based on what the president or those in the ruling party perceive you can bring to the table. Not intellectually. And I'm not saying people are not intelligent. But I'm just saying the, the, our approach to power and how it is distributed, a situation in which people come to the table believing they are presiding over a distribution agency, this is not the material that you, you know, when you're talking about power. You're talking about people who are leaders, you can't be a leader without a philosophy. The only reason why mo there are Muslims in Nigeria today is because the only prophet of Islam, you know, left the Quran. The only reason why we are Christians today, <laughs> Jesus Christ, what he said, is all in the Bible. 
Now, what you call the manifestos of political parties in Nigeria, most of the people who are in power today have no idea what the manifesto say because it was never meant to be, you know, uh, you know, to be followed. So when you are a leader, you have to have a script. You have to have a vision that people can buy into. Presently, what we have in Nigeria are office holders. Whether they, 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 they mutate to leaders is a completely different thing 